Okay, so normally I um, have about 150 slides for 15 minutes, and today I only have 22, so I might be finished in five minutes, who knows, I can normally uh, fill the time. Um, uh, that's just the thing. I'm actually going to follow on from Jens's uh, talk this morning and talk a little bit about failure. So I, I'm kind of interested in putting things a bit in perspective about the development of tools and what constitutes failure, what constitutes success, how we get there, uh, and particularly to do with databases. And in fact, I'm going to finish with a quote from Jens's colleague, uh, Torsten Madsen, who uh, I had the pleasure of spending two months with them 20 years ago, was it? Yeah, about 20 years ago, when they were developing IDEA. And I, that idea has you know, inspired me, among other things. So um, what sort of failure am I talking about? I'm talking about failure of dissemination. This is a much broader thing than just to do with databases or anything. It's to do with information flow within broadly the digital humanities, and more specifically within uh, computer archaeology. Do we know what's actually going on? And we come, of course, to conferences like this, but unfortunately, all the Ariadne people are over there. Uh, and the people are doing new st methods in stratigraphic stuff are down there. And we never get to really hear everything that's going. So dissemination of information is one of the big problems. And the result of that is often the reinvention of the wheel, or very often the reinvention of the square wheel. Uh, so I went looking for what I didn't realize was a meme, but the meme of the square wheel. Um, and there are dozens of drawings like this one, but I particularly liked the uh, annotated version of this that I didn't annotate, which I think says it all. Actually, I did annotate it. I added conference to the, uh, to the, uh, the bucket, or whatever it is, uh, because I have some strong opinions about how conferences should or should not be organized, but that's another story altogether. So what does reinvention of the, meal, the wheel mean? It means bespoke, bespoke structures and bespoke code. And I loved Enz's example of the uh, was it 30, 40, 50 tables all jammed into one screen with lines going in every direction, uh, which in fact is the reason for using things like Neo4j, or Heroes, which I'm going to talk about, where connectivity and flexible connectivity between things is easy to do and doesn't involve these ridiculously complex sets of relationships. Um, the startup delay, if you have to develop a MySQL or even a, a, a sorry, a, 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 an Access or FileMap or even MySQL, Postgres, whatever database, you're going to spend a lot of time at the start of whatever project you're doing, developing the tools to do the project. You should really have a database not the day you start the project, months before. Probably when you're ma making the grant application, you should have the database you're going to use in prototype. The high cost. You know, we know how much it costs to develop bespoke databases of any type. Maintenance costs. How if, if every single project has its own database or version of a database, every one of them needs to be maintained separately. And it's incredibly expensive, and it goes on being expensive. And the result is that uh, there's relatively little sustainability. Because when you get to the end of the project, the money runs out. You kind of keep it te teetering along as long as you can, and then you know, then it, it, entropy comes in. So what you end up seeing, I think, is you see survival of the fittest. You see, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean the best. Think of Betamax. Uh, survival of the fittest is probably. Uh, maybe the best, uh, the best supported being more institutional or whatever, or perhaps simply those with the most tenacity. Since I've now been doing Heroes for 15 years, and I was doing a database back in the 1980s called Minna, I guess I fall into the third category. I'd like to think I fell, fell into the first, but I definitely don't fall, in, fall into the second. And maybe you get in wheelment word I think I've just invented probably, by which I mean you become the go-to wheel. And I'm kind of getting some traction with Curious now after about 15 years, and particularly in digital humanities classes which are starting to use it, which means of course the future generation is being trained, and I like that, so I think that could finally be a, you know, uh, an accumulation of the snowball. So how does a system become known and understood? That's a referral back to that issue of uh, you know, how does information flow? 
if you've got something simple, and this one specially designed for my French colleagues, I gave this a, a bit of this talk the other day, uh, and this got a good laugh out of them. Um, if it's something simple, it's easy to understand what it is and why you need it. So you've got a bottle of wine in your hand, it's got a cork, but it's not an Australian bottle of wine, uh, and, or maybe Californian, I'm not sure, and yeah, you need one of these, and it's easy to explain how you use it, what you use it for, why you need it. Examples in our field, or very good, in the IT field at least, Microsoft Word, everybody knows what a word processor does. It's a typewriter, well, a sophisticated one that does images, word processing, page layout, etc., etc. but that's basically what it is. Everybody understands it. Spreadsheets, people think they understand them. Yeah, columns of numbers, some labels, then they try and use them for long texts. Uh, calculations, but then they want to do queries, and there's no control, etc., etc., and graphs. Fine, does that, it's easy to explain. People kind of see where it fits into their workflow. EndNote and Zotero, bibliographic referencing. Again, people know what a bibliographic reference is, how you use it, why you might want to use it. They can easily see they need it or they don't need it or they can't be bothered, but they probably do need it. But that's a, another matter. But, you know, it, it fits, it's easy to understand, it's easy to quote unquote sell. Or Omeka, for instance, which is getting more towards the database side of things. But actually, it's relatively easy to sell as an idea because it's about the web publication of objects. Storing the metadata and publishing them in nice web pages with a bit of a search built in and so on. It's relatively easy. Uh, and objects will, of course, be conceptual things as well as physical things. It's relatively easy to explain. On the other hand, faced with this, which um, I'm not sure being spread too thin, I don't think that tool would be particularly thin. It would probably be about this thick. It's much harder to explain why you need this thing, what you're going to do with it. I think something like SAP, business management, mega software, has that problem that you have to explain how does it go to affect, how does it fit in your workflow? Why do you need it? Well, of course, they have teams of sales people who go around, analyze your business, and tell you why you have to spend thousands of millions of dollars on their system. That doesn't really happen in uh, archaeology, digital humanities. The web browser is an interesting case because it's actually very simple. It's just a framework in which you have a web page, you click on something, you get another web page. Well, it was. These days, if you went back 25 years and tried to explain the web and the web browser as it exists today to somebody, myself, 25 years ago, with today's knowledge, you would be unable to explain or sell the idea of a web browser because the whole concepts of social media and so on just simply didn't exist at the time. So it's trying to like explain to a caveman, I use the, 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 uh, the uh, non-politically correct terminology advisedly, um, you know, uh, how to drive a car. I have a lovely example with golf carts and Donald Trump, but I, I couldn't fit it in some. <laughs> uh, and humorous is a little bit the same problem. It does. Everything. Everything is a landscape which goes as far as you can actually reach. Um, but it, it basically aims to do databases for everyone to do everything within the range of what we can achieve, which does not include uh, uh, 3D modeling, and it does not include sophisticated GIS, though it has mapping. It does not include um, large amounts of text analysis and text processing, but it handles text quite nicely. Uh, what it does? database creation, modeling entities and relationships, trying to bring some sort of sensible order into the sort of uh, spaghetti that you see in relational databases. It really works a bit like a relational database, but without all the complexity of building relational databases. Uh, you can extend your database spontaneously. You decide you need a new entity type, you want to make some new connections, you want to add new fields, change the fields. You can do all that on the live database instantly through a web browser. You can manage data, things like uh, uh, doing recoding of values, finding all the things and adding things to them, and so on and so forth. You can share and authorize people to have different sorts of access in by groups and subgroups and so on to different records in the database. Query and filter it so you can find a subset that you're interested in doing something with and analyze that subset or export it to Gephi or GIS uh, or whatever. 
And you can visualize as lists, as maps, as network diagrams, and so on, at a basic level. So in fact, if I go back to MINA, which I wrote in the 1980s, and I actually really wrote it as opposed to now, where I just get other people to write it, um, uh, it the, the reason why people liked it, it was a fairly basic sort of flat file kind of database with a few sophisticated bits added onto it was that they could do some basic initial analysis and see what they got and get printouts and things and use it. Uh, but then they could export the data into something else to do SPSS or whatever it was they wanted to do. And the other things that Purist has is web publication that you can create websites from it very easily and you can export to other packages and archive the data in a format that is uh, relatively sustainable. And I have to say, I was horrified this morning about people talking about converting everything to a CSV out of databases and going, well, somebody asked, what about the connection? So they so, said, well, very often you don't need the connection. I rarely come across databases where you do not need the connections between the tables, and you need a lot of extra knowledge. So it was almost like they'd, they said, oh, you have to write documentation about the database. It's like they passed over the importance of databases, which are about connecting different tables together. The thing about Purist is everyone can do it through a web browser. I say everyone. Everyone could do it if they were prepared to poke around and tackle it. Of course, many people just go, <laughs> and I have users who've been using Purist for six and seven years who want to change the length of a field, which means click, click, uh, and they get me to do it because they, they haven't. And other people who've never talked to me who've just built databases on their own. It's all about confidence. So don't, let's not have bespoke database. Let's not build databases which are specific to a particular project, which have all these problems of hosting, of backup, development, access to the database, and maintaining and documenting and archiving. Build, let's build things which are browser accessible, running on standardized, in the case of Purist, MySQL, standardized, excuse me, I'm done, thank you. Yeah, that's proving I don't know how to use a mobile phone. Um, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, based on standardized SQL servers or, or Neo4j or other servers where the, the, all the development effort is shared across multiple projects and centralized and sustainable. Those are the, the key takeaways. So I'll quickly go over, I'll skip over this, which is on the Heuris website, if you want to have a look at it, um, all the things it does. Uh, and that's the Heuris website. And at the bottom here is a button which you can click on and start creating a database. And it's a fully functional database and it's been around now for 15 years and you know we're still running databases which are nearly 10 years old. So it's fairly stable. It's also available on Humanum as well as on the University of Sydney service. Thank you, University of Sydney. Um, one of the problems we've had, though, is um, trying to get people past the first step. It's not difficult to use. And if you've got that sort of, I'll poke around and see what happens, it makes sense. But I actually get, a, I'm, I get an email every time somebody logs into the database. Uh, sorry, creates a new database. I also get an email when they use the browse templates function. And 90 plus percent of people never even click on browse templates. And it's like, for goodness sake, have a look, see what's there, you know. So when you do, uh, what, one of the things we've done recently to try and improve uh, sort of introduction to here is, if I know how to use this, which I, oops, no, I don't, I forget, is uh, the dashboard, which basically allows us well, allows people to put up a dashboard of commonly used functions. And we have a default one which comes up for new users, which tries to steer people into a bit of a pathway into the system. Um, and this browse templates basically gives you a set of databases that we've created as templates, and also any database, user databases that people have registered themselves. If I, as a user, register a database with Heurist, it's uh, indexed in a, believe it or not, Heurist database. Um, and uh, which is being searched here, and then other people can borrow the structures I've created, not the data, the structures. They can borrow, they can clone our databases because we've put some test data in, but they can borrow structure from other databases. So this is aimed at allowing people to set up useful structures for whatever, and say to people, and publish and say, if you want to use my structure, take it, 
and then modify it, because once you've downloaded it into your database, you can modify it, um, uh, which helps to start to build some sort of standardization without obliging anybody to use it. Um, we've got a couple of here, them here, the museum and the more or less templates that my colleague uh, Claire, uh, Claire Rila at, uh, uh, who's in Brisbane, has, have built, um, which, and basically, what it shows you is the record types that aren't already in your database. So if I click on one of the little download arrows for, say, context, um, it's going to bring in, as well as context, it will bring in any other record types that are connected to it, all the fields for those record types that it doesn't already know about, and all the uh, vocabularies and terms that it doesn't already have. So it basically gets everything it needs to be able to deliver that to you. So. Um, uh, we last about a week or so ago, we started building a database for this project, Laureate Project Today and You. Um, and they basically, unfortunately, <coughs> discovered Hearest towards the end of like last year of their project, but they're going to be doing a public exhibition of, um, of uh, Archaeology of the Pacific. Um, Archaeology of the Pacific, um, the history of archaeology, archaeological work in the Pacific. And so they're going to be using Hurus to generate that public uh, exhibition. Um, so this is the sort of data they've been collecting from the 50, I think, museums that they're um, getting objects for this exhibition from. Uh, I said, I don't think that's terribly standard. They said, no, 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 we followed museum principles. They said, mm, yeah, but wait and see what you get. Well, we can see what they get. So they're going to spend a long time trying to reinterpret all of that into some data. but. Uh, what we did uh, here is I downloaded the, muse the museum and MOLAS template, and you can see a series of new tabs have appeared. Normally, there would only be five when you open the new database, which contain all the data for these different um, different record types. And so, these are the different entities that are already defined in the MOLAS template in each of their uh, their different tabs. Just to horrify people, that's what. That's actually not the whole database. That's only about half the record types in the database. Looks terrifically complicated. It, it actually isn't. When you actually are using it, there are simple connections between things. Uh, so this isn't a particularly useful diagram. And I did actually have the complete mess up, which is even more. This is the initial uh, form that we got, a rather long, thin form, as it were. Um, for objects. So it's really about objects, and but it's got collection history, exchange history, who authorized the excavation, um, description of the object, description of its function, new function, etc. etc. Um, what I've done, in fact, then is to collapse it down into a series, into a much shorter form, with relationships across to other uh, sets of to those sets of data, so that you basically don't have to fill them all in. You fill in the ones that are in red, which are required, and the rest you fill them in if you've got the information, which you don't always have. And you can, in fact, use this more generally as a way of nesting levels of detail for different types of, uh, of database. Um, and so when I click on the one which is the detailed collection information, I get all the fields for detailed collection information, which themselves may, in fact, be. <coughs> Uh, links, for instance, the collector is a link to a person record. Uh, the collection location is a link to a place record. And that place record is reused for current place of exhibition, place of organizations, and other things like that. All of this, because we had it predefined, we probably defined all of this and redid all of this in one day. Uh, if we hadn't had it predefined, it would have taken maybe two days to build this. It's very quick to build. And we can change it around. So if I, I, Claire did the first version, and I changed it around in about half a, half a day. And that's what it looks like. A much simpler view than that very complicated view of things going in all directions, because you don't actually need to know about all of those things. You just need to know about the things that are connected. So here is an example of what Torsten and Jens called a metastructure database. In other words, the all Heuris databases all, uh, what's it called, um, IDEA databases, or Amica and RedCap databases, FAMES, EKI, have exactly the same structure. Um, they're all different, but have exact, each, all databases have exactly the same structure. There's enormous advantages in that. So instead of having this sort of 
This was the most complicated one I came across in a hurry, which is nothing like Jens's. But, um, uh, you know, uh, one-off bespoke structure, difficult to maintain, not very well documented, names that aren't very clear. I mean, what does context pottery mean? I have no idea. And I bet there's no description behind it. To something where all of those fields are the same in every database, there are now hundreds of them, uh, and there's a description behind every one of those fields, and the mm -hmm. schema of the domain that you're uh, studying is stored as data in the database, which means that once you have that database and the documentation about how Curious is structured, it's interpretable, and basically you can hit an archive button, get an XML version of it, you get an SQL version of it, and you get all the documentation when they load it in the holocube, it will just work. If there's ever a holocube. Um, uh, and here's another, uh, just a, another ex final example. Uh, a typical SQL, quite well structured database for uh, archaeological sites with information about things that have happened to them. And this is the equivalent Curious database. You know, that much simpler. Uh, uh, about half as many tables, effectively. and these little, uh, the, the fine writing is basically the pointer fields that connect all of those together. And pointers work like you know, one or two interleaving tables with repeatability, with requirements, and so forth. So I will leave you with Torsten's words. He couldn't have said it better, I think, 20, nearly 20 years ago, um, in praise of metadata database, meta structured databases. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.